was it Andy Warhol that said everybody's going to have a podcast for 10,000 hours? Well, now I have one. Says what it wants, but it's all contradicted. When it comes to boxers, the briefs, he's a, he's a little bit conflicted. Blacks the streets of that and now he's totally unrestricted. He's a man of conviction, but he's, but he's never been convicted. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Man of Conviction. My name is Matthew Gossin, and I will be your host. This podcast is going to be me talking to people in the TV and film industry, from stand-up comics to crew members, from actors to editors, and when no one else is available, I'll talk to my friends and family. So my next guests are Devin Hume and Abby Koshak, a couple who made a film together. The film is called Making a Killing. Uh, the film was written, produced, and directed by Devin, and Abby was an associate producer, production coordinator, and still photographer. This is really a solid first feature with an amazing cast. Listen to this. Mike Starr, Jude Moran, Christopher Lloyd, Aida Tuturo, Sally Kirkland, and Michael Jai White. Wow. They are on the East Coast right now, and they have agreed to talk to me over the phone. So here is my interview with Devin Hume and Abby Koshak. So I am here with Devin Hume and Abby Koshak, producer, associate producer, director of making a killing a great film that i watched uh yesterday and really enjoyed it i mean you directed the hell out of that dude it was it was super enjoyable i mean i saw the length and i was like oh it's kind of long but like nope i was i was with it the whole way so congrats seriously really good well thanks so much man appreciate that yeah thank you so the idea of this podcast is to just talk about the industry and you know how quirky it is and it's 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 a it's a it's a weird path to get into and then stay in and it's a it's a it's a crazy world right and um you were 19 when you got wind of this story right yeah exactly so i was in film school in colorado and uh i would take trips down to florence the town where the true story took place uh the story that we told um and that's where abby's from coincidentally um, oh wow we were just friends at the time she was living in california in uh going to a university at humboldt university uh-huh. i would go down to florence and make short films there on the weekends um with assignments from film school um coming from denver and um it turns out my good friends and abby's twin brother were living in the duplex next to a funeral home and that funeral home and that duplex were owned by the guys that i made the story about awesome um they were really awesome guys and they let me use their mortuary and their hearses and their you know anything they had that they would give me access to uh to make shorts so i made a lot of mortician short films and uh weird zombie movies and stuff and what great access. That's amazing. That's so cool. Yeah, I learned early on that, like, to separate myself from other filmmakers at the school, I had to go away from Denver, go find some weird, cool locations, and utilize, you know, what was around. And because I had all that production value in the morticians, uh, you know, kind of arsenal there, I yeah. took advantage of it. and I, I would have, too. That's, that's, so, that's so cool. Like, you, you wrote this... Before, obviously, well before you got financed for it and everything, right? You, or did you just have the idea and share it with with that producer you met, and then he uh, he said, "Let's make it," and then you developed it. How did how did the process go? The the idea for the story had been like as soon as I heard about that, you know, the actual story going down years later. You know, having known these guys, I lost touch with them for a good eight nine years. 
Right. And then I read in the papers about, um, you know, the them being accused of murder and, you know, one of them actually dying. So I had started, you know, writing notes and things. Okay, this is going to be a story someday, but not until I met the investor and did an elevator pitch on a beach. He was on the Big Island um, vacationing. He has a timeshare there. And he got wind of a story he wanted to do. He dabbled in documentary films and just kind of fancied himself a documentary filmmaker to be. Uh And he met some guy that piqued his interest. So he called around looking for a videographer to help him film an interview. Right. And he got my number. That's how we met initially. And then that shoot fell through. So I just invited him down to Kealakekua Bay to go snorkeling. And he said, oh, I don't snorkel, but my wife and I will meet you down there and we can have lunch or something. So we met and he said, oh, I looked at your short films. Do you ever think you can make, do you have any ideas that would make, you know, a good feature film that you can make some money off of? (laughs) And I said, I immediately pitched him this story and I said, I don't know if we can make money with it, but you know, this is, this is the best story I know right now, you know? So did your, the films that he saw were obviously piqued his interest and he was like, oh, this guy knows what he's doing. I, I could see talking to him about making another film. So you brought with you some, some cachet there, right? It was like, this guy knows what he's doing. Yeah, pretty much. It was, uh, I think my short films, because they were, you know, well produced in enough to, for somebody to say, okay, th- yeah, this guy can make movies, you know, um, or tell stories that's, visually at least. <laughs> that's great. That's, that's, that's so awesome. that, that spoke well for me, I think there. And it was also his novice that really got this thing going. He was just excited with the idea of being part of a film. Uh-huh. And he just wanted to play. He want go, go ahead. I I was just going to say he was excited about the fact that the story is a true story. That really piqued his interest. Coming from a documentary background, I guess. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I I told him I p- gave him my best elevator pitch, you know, somebody in a, long time ago when I first started out said, you know, always have a good elevator pitch for the movie you're trying to make. I didn't. (laughs) Um, But I knew that story so well, I just made it up on the spot and kind of improvised it and just... um, You sold him. Yeah. Yeah, you did a good enough job. (laughs) That's great. Well, man, I was... I was so impressed with the cast. I mean, you got you got so many great actors. It was just amazing. I mean, the script obviously it, it was enough that it, that these people are like, yeah, I'll, I'll make this. This looks good. And that I mean, Michael Jai White, Sally Kirkland, Mike Starr, Christopher Lloyd, Ada Turturro. Come on, I was I was so impressed. I was like, wow, he's looking at Christopher Lloyd. <clears throat> yeah. So so yeah, I was uh, I was I was hooked, dude. I was. I, the, your cinematographer, the, uh, the the Austrian dude, pair, right? Yeah, it's really great to see someone know, that knows what they're doing and can like takes time with a a shot. You know, v- re- again, very impressed, dude. Very impressed. That's really cool. So this is probably opened up some doors for you. I'm, I'm imagining you got something going on, right? As far as uh, making a movie, like, uh, yeah, another project maybe percolating somewhere. I have other projects that I'm writing right now, but. Um... I think there's a definitely a romantic idea that if you make a movie with some notable actors that people are going to be knocking down your door to make the next one. <laughs> and yeah. uh, it's not, that's not the case. <laughs> that's weird. Uh, I mean, I guess it's, it hasn't been that long either too since this came out, but, and there's a lot out there. Yeah, there's a lot of content, a lot of filmmakers out there, but it's also, you know, I haven't been knocking on other people's doors and I think that's, probably the biggest reason why I haven't made another film so quickly. Um, And I didn't want to either. I wanted, you know, I, I really took a lot of the producerial roles. Abby and I, uh, you know, produced this thing from post-production to through distribution pretty much on our own, including uh, the principal investor, Bruce. So it was, it was a long process that it kind of just, started slowing down recently um and it took a lot out of me personally because you know i wrote it directed it produced it and 
saw all that through distribution and taught myself how to distribute a movie. Well, I bet you did. Which that process is a lot... Um, I think, you, you know, you could do it once and do it r the right way, or you could do it five times and do it the wrong way, <laughs> you know. But I, I want to make the next one I do, the you know, to do it the right way. So I tried to learn as much as I could, but I also had to make decisions kind of with the cards that I was dealt or the product that I came out with, you know. Right, right, right. Uh, I was told by a good friend of mine, Early on, a filmmaker in L.A. said, you either want to make a really good movie or a really bad movie. <laughs> and if you make something in between, it's only going to do so well and it's not going to get a lot of attention. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I'm so proud of our movie. And because it was such an indie effort, I feel like, you know, and a lot of people feel like it's, you know, really well done for what we did it with. But in the grand scheme of things, when it competes against, you know, because um, when you put the, a film into the real world and it's competing against $35 million productions with A-list actors. It's not fair. <laughs> well, let, and then you could talk about a really bad film, quote unquote, Sharknado. OK, everybody's going right. to shit on that movie, but it's, you know, it's still a, a multi-million dollar bad movie that was done intentionally to be that. So, we, yeah, we ended up kind of somewhere in the middle and had to make a lot of hard decisions when it came to distribution and what it would mean for our investors and uh, where the film would be shown or if it would be shown. Interesting. I was involved producing a film a few years ago, and at least we had no... Uh known actors they were good actors but nobody you know no names and it was a comedy and it was it was uh we just thought it was gonna be bigger than it was and we thought it was gonna get more attention than it did like and it uh it's still so you know we're happy with it but we imagined like rolling into another movie right away you know and it's like that did not happen <laughs> right yeah like i said it's there's a romantic thing with filmmakers where it's like all right well I did the impossible. I got one off the ground. You know, I'll be just making films the rest of my life, you know. Uh, just like the first one, you just have to want it bad enough to make the second one. And I know I'll make another one. I don't know when that's going to be, but... You're not rushing it, yeah. No, and I, and I want to make another one, and I want to do it right, so... Um, it's just going to take time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, um... Do you want to talk about what you're writing, what other projects you have coming up? Well, Abby and I started writing a sci-fi film. A sci-fi romance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably around the time we started post-production for Making a Killing. Uh, so uh, last summer. Yeah, a little over a year ago. A little over a year ago, yeah. And uh, that one has been shelved because I've been writing... Not shelved completely, but just put it on the back burner because... I've been writing a dark comedy, which is where I feel like my strengths lie as a director and a storyteller right now. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to make a sci-fi. It's something I really want to do, but um, there's something a little bit just more pulling me towards making this other film right now. Um, but it's about degenerate gamblers and addiction on the East oh, Coast, uh, set in the world of horse racing and horse betting. <laughs> uh, oh, sounds great. <laughs> yeah. So we have some really talented actors we're going to attach to it soon and uh, kind of start the work of getting that, you know, towards pre-production. Um, the idea of us after making Killing was, all right, let's get a couple screenplays finished and just have them ready to go. You know, a couple different genres and a couple different options for anybody that might find us interesting as... Uh, producers you know to make more movies you know that sounds like a good plan very cool let's talk about your the vibe of the business like you know the idea of a of a movie set and like to me that's it's all it's such a it's like a camp it's like a it's own it's like a circus you know it's its own little world and um what do you think about that oh it's absolutely a circus yeah yeah <laughs> so in like a, I just keep bringing up these films I made in film school and you know, like my earlier days as a f uh, budding filmmaker, but the crew that I had on 
you know, my first mortician short that I directed is pretty much the same principal crew I had on Making a Killing. Wow. Peter was the DP way back in film school when I made Shiny Things, and Janae was the art director, and, you know, I had, you know, the the core, my team that I brought with me on Making a Killing, even though we hadn't worked together in a really long time, it was the same people that I brought back to be my A-team on this, and... Awesome. Jamie Pels, the co-writer, and Seth Tonk included. Uh, those were, you know, people that I worked with from the beginning. And I brought them into Making a Killing uh, because they're the best at what they do. And at the time and the place we were all at, mm -hmm. that meant making something from nothing. And you had to be ambitious and weird and ready to work and get things done and that usually means sleepless nights and a lot just passion you know for yep for the craft you know some people have it some don't yep it's true and we also we made the film in new mexico and there's such an awesome film community there so when we brought our core team and took advice from people that we knew, uh, filmmakers we knew in New Mexico, and said, okay, who was the best grip you worked with? Key grip. You know, who was the best Who's the gaffer? Best makeup artist. Makeup artist, you know. Yeah. Um, I have a friend uh, named Thomas Wingate who runs the Eves Movie Ranch in New Mexico, and he's been there forever. He lives on the property with his dog. And... Mm -hmm. um, he recommended crew from sets that he had seen come through the ranch because he sees all kinds of sets. You know, Dust Till Dawn was shooting there. Um, the Cohen Brothers. Just Cohen Brothers, there. yeah. Um, Busker Shrek. So he knows all the you know local crew, and I just said, all right, who were the who were the guys that you you know you would work with again? And he's a great judge of character. He'll tell somebody to to fuck off <laughs> real quick. You know, uh, that's good. And so we just put this together, this just gypsy band of misfits, and <laughs> we all kind of camped out in Las Vegas, New Mexico, and just made, we're able to make that town our, our studio, our back lot, you know, because it was such a small town. And it was so welcoming. The town was just so accepting of what we were there for, and we actually moved there a month before we started filming just to you know, location scout and find the cars we needed and to kind of smart you know become part of the community and utilize the community and kind of you know make sure that we weren't just taking we were also giving when we were there and they were probably glad to have you know more people to maybe eat in the diner and stuff right <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, and yeah. they've been making movies in Las Vegas, New Mexico since the silent era. Yeah, I for mean, the past hundred years. Yeah. yeah, they they have a really rich history of films, but it's very spread out. It was like Red Dawn, the original Red Dawn was shot there, and then. Oh wow! Yeah, with Tracy. I I have a connection to that. I have my, one of my distant cousins was a producer on Red Dawn, so. Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Buzz Feichens. That's a, awesome. That's a distant cousin of mine. Yeah. Go on. The, you know, making films in Las Vegas was like, just like making films when I was making them in Florence. It was a small town vibe where, okay, there's a black Cadillac that, you know, Arthur can drive. Oh, there's a house that has two black Cadillacs that Arthur can drive. <laughs> let's talk, to, let's go knock on their door, talk to them, see if we could get both of those cars in case something happens to one of them. <laughs> and... And something good. Sure enough, yeah. <laughs> that exact scenario happened, and on the the guy drove one of them to set one day and got hit by wow. somebody. And <laughs> you had a backup car. That's amazing. We did. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were flagging people down. We would see a car that, or a truck rather that would be perfect for the film, and you know we would wave them down and just you know tell them what we were doing and start talking to them. Um, this awesome guy Frank let us use his truck for Orlando's truck. And it was absolutely perfect. That's awesome. And the town too, there wasn't Adobe houses. That's normally what you find in New Mexico. Um, mm. It was kind of like, it could be anywhere America, which right. was perfect for 
what the vibe was for the film. Yeah, that was a big thing for us. It, when we went down multiple times to New Mexico to Location Scout, we just kept finding these beautiful adobe towns. And it was like, we don't want to be in a like a Breaking Bad atmosphere. We want to be in a Southern Colorado, anywhere America kind of feel. And it's a really funny story how we landed upon Las Vegas. Um, so... In the film, I'm sure you noticed that uh, the town's called Cardinal, right? Right. So I we had written that, you know, weeks before this trip, and we ended up in Las Vegas, and we were kind of like, all right, this isn't going to work. We just saw, like, a tip of the town, and then we looked left out of the window, and there was a huge sign that said, Home of the Cardinals, and that's, like, the mascot of the high school there. Right. So we're like, all right, let's keep investigating this. And sure enough, we found, you know, exactly what we were looking for. No Country for Old Men was shot in that town. Um, Let's see, Easy Rider. You know, there's just so many cool little parts. A lot of filmmakers have found that town. And, you know, yeah, Longmire, of course, Breaking Bad shot there. And I didn't know any of that before we shot there. So it was kind of like I stumbled upon that town just like... A lot of filmmakers must have, and it was on a list that the New Mexico Film Commission gave us, but it was just away from other places we were trying to look at as potentials that it was kind of a last minute, all right, let's check this out on the way back to Denver, you know. And we used the same hotel that they used in um, No Country for Old old Men. That was was the same hotel? Yeah, the same hotel, ran by a really nice lady and her son. Very cool. Well, that was... um... Yeah, I was really impressed, guys. I was really impressed. Any um, production stories you want to tell? Like some any stories that you that you tell, you know, to friends about your making that movie? Uh, oh, dude, I could talk about this movie for weeks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> how about this? How about this? Let's talk about Michael Jai White and how really good he was. Right, that guy gave you a great performance. I thought he was. I thought he was amazing. Yeah. So. We were looking for an Orlando for a long time. We were going through casting. Uh, you know, we made offers to people and uh, it got turned down. And, you know, when we went to L.A. for casting for this, people ate it up. Like, big actors, man. You know, A-list actors really liked it, but they were busy or they were booked for our shoot dates or, you know, they were cost way too much money <laughs> than what we had uh We just kept going down lists, and our casting director, you know, mentioned Michael Dry White, and we're like, oh, yeah, he'd be great. Uh, We'd love to see him play a role like this, and let's see if he likes it. So we sent the script to his agent, and we didn't get an answer for probably a week. And we went to other actors. We started, we, I think we went to Anthony Mackie next, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, like... You know, and he liked it, but he was busy. Um, you know, we just kept going down the list. And then all of a sudden, I think probably f- two weeks before we started shooting, Michael Jai White calls me at 10 o'clock at night. And he's like, I don't know how this happened, but I didn't get this script, but I just read it and I want on this film. I don't care what it takes. Get me on this movie. Wow. That's awesome. That was really cool. It gave me a, a, a shot, like a B12 shot in the ass. It was like... I bet. Because um, we were getting down to the wire, finding one of our pivotal characters. And he just, you know, Michael Jai White puts his heart into every role. You know, he's one of the premier martial artists working in Hollywood. He's just, he lives every word he speaks. He's, you know, a Buddhist, just true to his word hard-working man and he's talented beyond belief so just to just to watch him work and see how he embodies a character and what he did with it was really great um same with mike star i mean mike star is one of my favorite actors and then jude moran he was good i i I facebook friended him today i saw him i was like hey he, he accepted so that's Sounds great, good. man. Yeah, I, f- I found Jude <laughs> 10 years ago in a casting session. I was helping with my buddy for another film, and I've put Jude in anything I could since then. <laughs> uh, and f- for this film, it was, uh, you know, my first feature, and I was like, there's no way Jude Moran's not in my movie. And um, Jude really delivered for you, yeah. He's so talented, man. And he, he and Mike just 
really bonded and made something special out of that relationship in the movie, I think. And Christopher Lloyd, boy, he really looked like crap. <laughs> you right? I mean, you, you really muddied him up good. He was he was looking wretched. Yeah, he's. I mean, he was pushing eighty at the time, and that guy has. He's like a six fifty year old man on set. You know, he's yeah. ready to go. He's always he's always there to act across from other characters, and he was the definition of a class act to work with. He he wasn't high maintenance. He was just you know old school ready to ready to come to work you know <laughs> and uh you know of course I'm I was 28 at the time and it was pretty awesome to be around you know Doc Brown and you know just have that guy that I grew up with you know Roger Rabbit you know all those movies that he's been in um you know in those early 90s days he was just so so much a part of my what made me want to be a filmmaker growing up watching all those movies so but same, I'm not really same. a starstruck kind of guy. I would just, you know, say, okay, man, like, how can I push this guy a little bit? How can how can I learn from him in this moment? Because it's so short-lived. We only had Chris for seven days. Yeah, a week, yeah. Um, and Michael, the same thing. It was like we needed him for 20-some-odd days, and he had to fly to Africa to do um, some fight promotion in the middle of it so it was like kind of stretching the time with all these people you know all this these special little moments we could muster up Aida Turturro she's brilliant uh, oh yeah she was great she was yeah. so good and uh Sally Kirkland you know oh, um and the the New Mexico talent Tate Fletcher Joe Berryman uh, Andy Kostelik who's a really awesome young up-and-coming director actor he played Greg the blonde-haired kid in the movie. Uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. Jack Forcinito. Jack Forcinito, another good friend of mine. He played the the sheriff. Um, David Midthunder. It was just yeah, David Midthunder. It was amazing. it was such an awesome. It was just Butterfly. Butterfly Garcia. Yeah. yeah, it was a great group of people to bring together to have fun with for you know twenty eight days or whatever it was. Yeah, we became a family. You know, the crew definitely. We all. Got to know you each bond. really well and bonded, and we still yeah. are friends till this day. Yeah, that's what our short film sets were like, and we we're like, all right, this is f- you know short films, and you know when I just didn't think that kind of attitude and atmosphere would transition to working with Hollywood types because I'm not a Hollywood guy, man. I've I've been to L.A. a couple times, but I've never been on a L.A. set. Um, yeah, I'm sure the words I just said or make me obviously not a Hollywood <laughs> actor or a director, but um, I just always made movies the way I just started making movies, right? And just kind of took that Orson Welles um, or Hitchcock approach to it where it's just like, I'm just going to do what I think is the right way to do it. And I think we, if we did anything that was, um, you know, really good, really well done or a success, it was... The team we brought together on both sides of the camera to make what we made. Yeah, the vision that you conveyed, that Devin conveyed, was absolutely brilliant. And it was, at one point, I was, because I was the producer on the film, but also the production coordinator. And I did the set photography, so I was bouncing around everywhere. But at one point, I just remember everyone kind of, you know, everyone coming together for this one vision and it was all inside of Devin's head at one point, and now it was a reality. And it was just so amazing to see that come to life. Well, you guys should be very proud of what you did because it, it, it's a it's a real accomplishment, and it's 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 a quality piece of work. And I'm jealous, to be honest. <laughs> but in well, a let's good make way. a movie together, man. <laughs> hey, yeah, I, I've got some ideas. I, have, I have definitely have some ideas. Um, one of the lines in the movie that made, that made me laugh out loud was, uh, you know, t- to know not to kick a turd on a hot day. <laughs> yeah, that's Jamie. Yeah. That's Jamie. Um, yeah, my uh, the co-writer on the film, Jamie Pels, definitely had some good one-liners in that. Um, yeah. He's a talented dude. Well, guys, let me just say thank you so much uh, for being uh, my guest here on the Man of Conviction podcast. People look for Making a Killing out there. It's available on Amazon right now, right? 
Yeah, it's on Amazon, Vudu, Google Play, YouTube, all kinds of places, and in eight different territories around the world. Awesome. Um, I'll, I'll put a link out there for everybody. And again, thanks for showing up. <laughs> Appreciate it. Yeah, it was great to talk to you, man. Awesome. Thank you so much, Matthew. Yeah, good to talk to you, Matthew. You too. Bye. I want to thank Daria Benedict for the opening and closing music. And please support this podcast through Patreon by going to manofconvictionpodcast.com and becoming a patron. Email me at manofconvictionpodcast at gmail.com. Follow me on Instagram, manofconvictionpod, or on Facebook, manofconvictionpodcast. And if you're still listening, maybe leave me a nice review. Thank you. Says what I want, but it's all contradicted. When it comes to boxers, the briefs, he's a he's a little bit conflicted. Walks the streets of the town, nice, totally unrestricted. He's a man of conviction.